psychopaths. There's, there's us, and then there's psychopaths. There's, there's, there's good people who understand how rules work, and then there's psychopaths. We don't have to look at any of the evil in ourselves, because wherever we see evil, it's just psychopaths. Uh, so uh, Jung would say that all of our attempts to understand crime and recidivism uh, from the perspective of uh, labeling somebody as deviant or psychopathic or antisocial uh, is basically us just failing to acknowledge that the answer for why people commit crimes is quite simple. Why did, why did somebody kill somebody else? You know why somebody killed somebody else, says Carl Jung. You've wanted to kill people, and yet you've got to find reasons. You've got to find reasons. You've got to find traits uh, that predict why people want to kill people. No, no, you know why people want to kill people. Look within yourself. Ignore the bullshit ego <laughs> facade that you put on for society and take a nice reflective look and you'll see it's obvious why people kill people. Uh, most males fantasize quite regularly about killing people uh, and slightly less than most, i.e. slightly less than half of females, at least admit to fantasizing about killing people fairly regularly. And yet, and yet we need, we need these, these, these great othering uh, type of examples of, of, of constructs. Like, what's psychopathy? This is why people do it, because they're so different than us. Uh, so, a little bit of history of the psychopathy concept. Um, it's been described as a wastebasket category. So the word psychopathy, so we're not necessarily talking about the concept of psychopathy, but the word psychopathy before it got glommed onto the concept of psychopathy. The word psychopathy was just kind of a wastebasket category, which is my favorite description for it, wastebasket category. So if somebody was on some particular behavior, very unlike the rest of society, then they were psychopathic about that. If somebody ate exclusively garbage, uh, then they were psychopathic eaters. If somebody uh, had uh, 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 weird uh, sexual preferences, then they were sexual psychopaths. Same-sex interested individuals were sexual psychopaths uh, uh, up through the early 1900s. Uh, uh, that's, this is how we were using the term psychopath. If you were, you know, uh, kind of against the societal norm in some way, you were psychopathic uh, on that uh, trait. <laughs> this was, of course, before the DSM. So the DSM-1 came out in 1952, and we started formalizing things. They started with a concept uh, called uh, sociopathy, and then psychopathy was kind of subsumed under that. That's how the term got started. Now it means something quite specific, right? Slightly less than 1% of the population meets threshold for psychopathy, and it means a, an extreme degree of antisociality. Okay, we know what it means now, but we didn't have that meaning just 100 years ago, or that specific meaning. One of the reasons uh, this tends to be both an easy and a disappointing lecture for me is that it's so easy to just put all of our uh, uh, anxieties and interpretations of, of why do people do bad things into this concept of psychopathy. Oh, some people don't have empathy. They're broken. They're like selfish robots that just want to satisfy their sexual appetites or whatever. It's too easy, people. It's, don't let yourself do this with, with psychopathy. Yes, there's a trait psychopathy. It doesn't explain as much as you think it does. Uh, a quick look in the mirror at all of the unmentionable desires or impulses you've ever had is going to explain far more about the terrible things in the world than the construct of psychopathy. The construct of psychopathy is predictive on who's going to act on these things, but it's not necessarily going to help you understand why people do things that they do. Uh, all the work still needs to be done, uh, even after you have the construct of psychopathy in your mind. So that's in part a history of the word psychopathy before it got affixed to the concept of psychopathy. So what's the concept of psychopathy? Pinel. Once you kind of look backwards from an understanding of psychopathy, you realize how cool Pinel's uh, uh, conception of it was. Mania without frenzy. This just seems contradictory, right? Mania, you're manic, but you're not frenzied. So in other words, you, are, you have a, a calm madness, a calm mania. That's pretty cool, right? Like, like imagine somebody, somebody like, as calm as a cucumber in front of you, but you look in their, your eyes, and they are manic despite being calm. You've got my attention. I mean, you're either saying nothing by contradicting yourself, or you've got my attention. And then Pritchard uh, fits kind of the way I was describing our use of the word psychopathy, uh, which is just uh, moral insanity. Freud weighed in on psychopathy, and you, you obviously know what Freud had to say. With Freud, the ego is uh, specifically working on satisfying the appetites of the id, and it's like the superego didn't even come around. It's, it's, it's like it had no, 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 no mommy, had no, no papa, no, no police, uh, no god, no nothing to stop you. The ego is acting solely in service of the appetites. How can I get more? How can I get more of my id uh, in, in a way that's still manageable in society, but not in a way that is uh, strictured by you know, deontological ethics or, or, or you know, grand principles of, of, uh, that you might uh, have been taught by your parents or your religion. Cleckley's formulation was probably the most influential, in part because he just drew up a list of traits of psychopaths, and that's what psychopathy is today. It's a list of traits. How many of them do you have? If you have enough, then you have psychopathy. He developed the form for figuring out psychopathy, and he figured out most of the checklist items that we still use. He was wrong on some, but right on most of them. Uh, so for Cleckley, it was like you had a mask of sanity, a nice calm face, and maybe you are emoting. You look like you're, 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 you're hitting all the right emotional notes. You look like it but it's like you're dancing to no music, and it's weird. There's no music in your soul. Your face is just, just moving in the right proper way at the right time, and there's nothing behind it. It's a mask. 
You've, 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 you've got a millimeter of emotion and nothing more. There's nothing back there. You've got dead eyes. There's nothing behind your face. That's Cleckley's conception. The way he drew up how to find, spot a psychopath, determine when you're dealing with a psychopath, has stayed with us. Robert Hare in BC uh, drew up the psycho uh, psychopathy checklist. Most of his initial work was copying and pasting Cleckley, adding based on his, his copious experience interviewing prisoners and whatnot. But, uh, but Cleckley is, 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 is a good chunk of the psychopathy, uh, psychopathy checklist, which is how we define psychopathy. The DSM is trying to get in on the game. Finally, they're trying to say, hey, here's our idea of how psychopathy works and, and our checklist for it. Um, but I mean, they're way late. Uh, we're still in the realm of Robert Hare's psychopathy checklist. And honestly, the DSM is only good to the extent that it is just copying and pasting Hare's work. Uh, let's look at the case of a psychopath. This is a classic case from back in the day. Red uh, ran away from home. Uh, as a young man, uh, he did not like rules, uh, so he said, well, I'm going to go get away from the rules. Being a psychopath, and I'm not going to use people first language because it's, it's, it's exhausting. Being a person with psychopathy is just exhausting. I'm just going to say psychopath. So being a psychopath, he was not necessarily well versed in doing work that's not immediately rewarding. Uh, so he lived with his sister. Uh, it's called the parasitic lifestyle. He lived with his sister. How did he justify living with his sister when he should have been in school? This was the lie that he somehow sold to his sister. He said, I did so well at school last term, which I think in high school you still call it terms. Uh, you know, so, uh, I did so well at school last term that I don't have to go to school this term. That was the lie that his sister bought uh, while he was staying with his sister. So you see the boldness of the lie he sold while staying at home while his sister worked to pay for the house he was living in. A t telegram came uh, and they said, your father has died. To which Red responded, cha-ching, but wait, I'm gonna have to share my inheritance with my sister. He lied to the will executors. He said, oh yeah, my sister would get half, right? She's dead, she's dead. And I have the documents to prove it. So he didn't kill her, he just made up documents saying she was dead. Forged some documents in order to get all of the inheritance from his father. And then he just lived off the inheritance. He made some uh, fair weather friends and just drank and lived off the inheritance. There was a first obvious case of violence where he assaulted one of his friends with a baseball bat. This was one of the friends who was staying with him and kind of living off the inheritance, so nothing really came of it. He got married once, it didn't last, and by age 21, he blew all the inheritance. Now, I don't have the number for how much it was, so this would be more impressive probably if it was a big number, but I don't know what it was. But he blew all the inheritance by age 21, so now what do you do? Um, now, you apply the parasitic lifestyle techniques you use with your sister, and you apply them to uh, romantic interests. So he lived woman to woman, letting them provide for him uh, for as long as they could stand him. Then he was with a woman long enough to be uh, common law, so at least two years. And by this time he was 30, uh, and he assaulted his common law mate, and then had to go to prison for the assault. She was like, oh, you're in prison for assaulting me, let me come and bring you cookies. There was presumably something seductive or interesting about this individual that they could make his common law spouse do this, come back. Of course, what, what was he doing? Was he just spending all of his time writing love letters to her? No, he was writing love letters to other women, so that when he got out, he would spend some time with his common law spouse until she got sick of him, and then he would have women lined up for when they in turn got sick of him so that he could have places to live. This, this was his idea of work. <laughs> all right, so uh, he had, uh, well, that we know of, three other offers of women who said, oh, you can come and stay with me. <laughs> not that they knew about each other, obviously. So this is red. He's not burying copious amounts of bodies of children that he's killed in his backyard. This is kind of a different type of, of psychopath story. On the level of service inventory, red score's really high, i.e. we'd predict he'd be pretty dangerous to put with other people. On the psychopathy checklist, he scores really high as well. In Canada and in the US, we have a, a, a cutoff score of 30 uh, for psychopathy. That is, if you score on Robert Hare's psychopathy checklist revised 30 or higher, then you are a psychopath. Okay, so that's the categorical version. Uh, what if you are Brazilian? If you're in Brazil, it's a 26. If you score 26, then you are categorically a psychopath. So there are local norm differences. And in Canada and the US, we have the highest threshold. That is, we are least likely to falsely identify people as psychopaths because 30 is the highest standard set anyway. But of course, it's set by norms. So it's not like a benevolent thing on our part. It's more of a red by his traits. Uh, would, we, we would predict he would be uh, quite likely to reoffend, be a potential danger to other people. And this is the use of the psychopathy checklist or the level of service inventory, which are the two most commonly used risk assessment devices in Canada. Here's another one that you've probably heard of. This is probably more your typical idea of a psychopath, John Wayne Gacy, famous for dressing up as a clown at kids' parties. Uh, he was beloved as a pillar of the community, which got him out of lots of trouble with people because they were like, no, he's the clown guy, right? We love him. Yeah, also, maybe one of the reasons why culturally we're scared of clowns. Or culturally, there's a meme about being scared of clowns, uh, literally, to take that. So, uh, John Wayne Gacy, uh, as with all people who have done terrible things in their lives, they have it. My life sucked so much backstory, right? Uh, it's not my fault I was abused by my father. Well, that is, that is a factor, and I will grant you that that is one of the reasons your life sucked and that you made other people's lives suck. I'm not a sucker for the story. Dropped out of high school, um, so like Red, you know, you don't like authority, so you run away from it. His first job was in a mortuary, but he got fired because uh, the owner of the mortuary uh, came back after Gacy's shift, and he had moved all the bodies He's doing something with the bodies, and so he lost his job in the mortuary. How do you lose a job dealing only with dead people? 
Um, but he got a job through his wife. Uh, his wife's father got him a job of a manager of KFC. And he liked the, having the authority. What he was doing at this time was he was starting to solicit underage boys for behavior that we're not supposed to engage in with underage boys for good reasons. At this point, he escalated up to the point of raping a 15-year-old boy. The police said, yeah, we kind of believe you, but John Wayne Gacy, he like dresses up as a clown and everything, and like people love him in the community. And basically, you're a 15-year-old boy, and it'll be your word against Gacy's. So we'll, we'll, just, just let's leave it at this. We'll say we'll believe you, and then you should probably just drop the charges. Like, we'll look into it, but you probably don't bother. Um, so there... Uh, the police's idea of looking into it uh, was going in and searching his house. And so there's charges that, uh, that, you, that you raped this boy, but we're, we'll look for evidence. And he said, come on in. I'm a pillar of the community. As you know, I'll come to your kid's birthday party. And what happened was they charged him with possession of pornography. His fellatio is sodomy under U.S. law. He can get charged uh, with a sexual crime. Um, but that's all he was charged with. Okay, so that's it. He raped a 15-year-old boy. Well, you know, it's going to be your words against his. We'll just charge him with whatever other stuff we can charge him with that doesn't involve your story versus his story. So at this point, he does his two seconds of time, and he gets a little braver, and he starts engaging more in... He, he starts playing out his fantasies a little more. He's binding and assaulting individuals, one of which came and said, John Wayne Gacy tied me up and assaulted me. And John Wayne Gacy was not charged in this case. And then he started making up stories. So he said, uh, I'm working for the governor, the state governor, and the state governor wants me to run these experiments. And guess what? They were weird sex experiments. And so your participation will help science and will help our state. This was a 15 and an 18 year old. Uh, they had conned into these experiments, but of course something didn't quite smell right. So it came to the attention of the police again. And for doing these things, he got 10 years in prison and his wife finally left him. Or at least was charged with 10 years in prison. Uh, he, of course, is a model citizen, right? So he got early parole for being a quote-unquote model inmate. And now he's even more emboldened slash embittered than before. So what's going to happen now? He started his own contracting company. Now, one of the reasons I choose this example is because it's kind of the opposite of Red in terms of parasitic lifestyle. John Wayne Gacy eventually owned his own company and provided employment for other people, right? So they're the opposite on that trait, at least. So um, he's, he's working in a contracting company. Uh, what he does to attract young men into working for his company is he offers them roughly double the pay of other individuals. Uh, so you have two things there. One, you're going to have your pick of the litter in terms of young men who are coming to work for you. Uh, two, if they don't like the way you're treating them, you can say you're free to walk out the door and get paid half as much for this work. So he's engaging with his employees in, in weird ways. And in the community, there are young men disappearing. But they're the young men that society doesn't necessarily look too much into their disappearance because they're troubled. They have a history of running away from home already. So, you know, maybe, maybe they're just missing because they're out with their friends or they've left town. One thing he's doing with the young men is something called a rope game. Uh, so he would take a rope and he'd take a hammer uh, and he'd say, all right, the goal is you want to last as long as you can uh, before you say uncle. Uh, and, and you put the rope uh, uh, around your neck. And then you take the handle of the hammer, you put it in the rope, and then you twist it so that the rope is getting tighter with the handle of the hammer. This is one of the games he was playing with the young men. Kind of a suffocation, strangulation game. Finally, one of Gacy's targets was the type of kid who wouldn't run away. The type of kid for whom disappearance requires an explanation in terms of it's, it's not expectable that this kid would disappear or miss, it, miss an evening. The Peist family said, where's my kid? Uh, and it turned out that the last place the kid was seen was entering John Wayne Gacy's van. Okay, so this finally puts some attention back on Gacy, who now has a history, so there's a reason to suspect him. But of course, he also still has lots of gumption, and he says, all right, come on in, investigators. Come on in. Don't need a warrant. Come on in. Talk to me. Sit down in my living room. And if you've seen the Febreze commercials that talk about nose blindness, uh, Gacy was nose blind to the smell of decaying corpses, and the investigators were not. So he invited them in, and they were like, oh, okay. We're going to need a warrant and a backhoe, probably. Um, and we're going to dig up some bodies. And that's exactly what happened. Some were just barely buried in the crawl space, right underneath where they had been sitting and having their tea or whatever it was. But there were some bodies uh, buried in the back. 27 bodies on his lot. And to add a little extra uh, psychopath icing on the cake, lack of remorse, uh, I never killed anyone who didn't try to take advantage of me. The kids in his employ, uh, who he was paying double, they were trying to take advantage of him by accepting his offer of employment. Therefore, he could, he could, he could do weird sex things and then kill them. The kids that he picked up off the street, well, they were probably trying to to somehow manipulate him as well. But guess what? According to Canadian North American standards, John Wayne Gacy is not a psychopath. He scored exactly 29 on the psychopathy checklist. He's not a psychopath. He's a psychopath in Brazil, but he's not a psychopath in Canada or in the US. And that's why I mentioned the parasitic lifestyle. Uh, what we can do is we can look at the traits and then we can look at Gacy on the traits. So glibness or superficial charm, all right? So this is kind of like the pleasant aspect, the salesman aspect of the mask of sanity, right? Superficial charm. Uh, it's effortless the way you pretend to be happy and pretend to like me. Grandiose sense of self-worth. 
uh, need for stimulation or proneness to boredom. Pathological lying, basically it's the rate at which you lie. You just lie more often. Psychopaths aren't necessarily better at lying. They're better at convincing you of things and getting you to do things. But in some cases, it's not because they convince you that they're truthful. They just convince you that, well, to act as though what I'm saying is true is the best course of action. So it's not necessarily that they're better liars in that sense. They're better manipulators and they're more frequent liars. But if you had to guess whether they're lying, you'd do just as well. It actually, in fact, uh, we tend to think that psychopaths are lying more than they actually are because their delivery is so flat uh, like in terms of emotion. Um, at least that's in the uh, malingering literature. So we, we there as professionals. Conning and manipulative behavior, uh, you know, like faking your sister's death with, with forged documents. Lack of remorse or guilt, uh, shallow affect. Again, it just seems to be like a millimeter of your face and there's nothing behind it. Uh, lack of empathy, parasitic lifestyle, like red. Uh, poor behavioral controls, promiscuous sexual relations. So each of these items uh, is going to have a score uh, based on a, a clinical interview, if you can do it, a case history, and any other documentations you can get your hands on. And you're going to have for each of these items a zero, a one, or a two. So there's 20 items, meaning the max score you could get is 40. Early behavioral problems, lack of realistic long-term goals, uh, so it's a kind of planning aspect. Uh, you, you have a difficult time planning. You, you might be able to plan out an offense really well, like, like how you're going to trap somebody or something, but then what are you going to do afterwards? Uh, you, that you're probably not going to have figured out. Impulsivity, which this is already kind of represented with need for stimulation, proneness to boredom. We're just starting to see factor analyzable latent traits here. Irresponsibility, failure to accept responsibility for your own actions, many short-term marital relationships, juvenile delinquency, uh, revocation of conditional release, and criminal versatility which we've already seen is a, is a risk factor for offending in general. Given all of these things, this is, this is what the psychopathic checklist consists of. I mean, it's obviously training in how to interpret these things, but you give each one a zero, a one, or a two. So let's look at John Wayne Gacy. All right, two on nearly everything uh, so far, except parasitic lifestyle. We lost two there. Lack of realistic long-term goals. Well, he had a company. He was trying to build a company, so he can't, can't get that. Early behavioral problems. No, he kept his nose clean, at least in terms of what we found out about. So this is where he failed to be a psychopath. He uh, behaved well or wasn't caught uh, early on. Uh, and he made his own way financially. I mentioned that we have, uh, we use the PCLR quite a bit in uh, corrections. Pretty good prediction rates for reoffending. It doesn't do quite as well at violent recidivism as things like the VRAG, the Violence Risk Appraisal Guide. It's great to use in conjunction with something that is more specialized to violence, if that's what you're concerned about. So what we tend to do is we'll add together the PCLR and items from the VRAG, uh, and then we get a correlation uh, that explains, explains away or, or removes about a fifth of the error if we had just guessed the mean in every case. That's what, that's what your R is going to mean. What's, what are some of the items in the VRAG? School problems, alcohol abuse, separation from parents before the age of 16. For my graduate course, we were doing the VRAG. It's in the uh, forensic science department at Trent. But we did the VRAG on Tuesday. And I had my grad students go through. And I said, OK, imagine you've been falsely convicted of a violent crime. And now I'm doing the VRAG on you. And so we went through the VRAG and we saw the risk. And one of the students had a 47% chance of reoffending if I let her go based on her life history including, you know, separation from parents before the age of 16. Uh, but of course, you accept out if one of your parents died. So if that's why you weren't raised by both parents, well, then that doesn't count against you. So Hare has since divided the PCLR up into four factors, but I don't really like them. I kind of like the original two. So you have the affect of an interpersonal dimension. The individual with psychopathy doesn't tend to feel the same way about things, doesn't tend to value, uh, well, obviously the rights of other people, but doesn't, doesn't tend to value and, and, and respond to uh, interactions in the same way, uh, which is very general way of putting the factor, but it's a latent factor, so it is very general. So disregard for others, habitual lying or lack of remorse, persistent financial dependence on others, because that's not very, it's not very nice, uh, an interpersonal uh, thing to do, taking advantage of your sister and lovers and whatnot. So that's the first primary dimension, which you get if you, you factor analyze, you look at the, the, the main latent factors. Uh, affective interpersonal factors out first, so it's the biggest, and then impulsive antisocial, which primarily deals with behavior-related issues, acting on things that could have been driven or related to the other factor, but not necessarily because you could have a lot of situationally determined offending. A lack of loyalty to friends, so do you offend even against people close to you? Uh, not taking responsibility for your actions. So these are two factors. I point them out because last week we talked about the age drop-off for the, for the SFC, the salient factor scale. It, it was 41, right? The day that you turn 41, your risk of reoffending decreases. Congratulations, you've graduated, you're 41 now, you're less of a risk to society. Uh, we see this uh, in psychopaths uh, as well. Uh, so with uh, even, you know, amongst the most dangerous or maligned or other of offenders, uh, we see our impulse of antisocial tends to go down with age. And what, where do we see the most uh, uh, drop-off? We see the most drop-off right around age 40. So, so we're looking at the white, the white line. Uh, so when you're, when you're 15 and 20, uh, uh, your, 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 your factor score is highest in terms of relative uh, uh, impulsive antisocial uh, behavior rates. Uh, and then you chill out as you age, and then there's a big drop-off after age 40, i.e. you are expressing uh, your antisocial behaviors and you are acting on your impulses less as you age with a big drop-off at age 40. Uh, so this is in part uh, the literature behind the decisions for 
VRAG and for uh, a salient factor score scales to say, well, after age 40, we're going to predict you're going to be less likely to act out socially. Your behavior is chilling out, which is, which is what we care about. Desistance. Desistance is the vocabulary word from your textbook that, that they use for this. Uh, how many people here have heard of the word sociopath? Sociopath. Yes. Can you get diagnosed as a sociopath? No. Not unless you're in the 50s. We don't have a scale for it. I know, I know, I know, I know. You can Google books about sociopaths and they treat it as if you can get diagnosed with it. Sociopathy uh, uh, is, uh, was a broad category from the DSM-1 from 1952 uh, and it was kind of, you know, uh, it, it was related to the wastebasket category idea of psychopathy. So if you were sociopathic, it meant that in society you had pathology. You interacted with society in a pathological way. You were a sociopath, all right? And it had a few subcategories under this heading. One thing I also want to point out is in the DSM-1, we talked about things in terms of reactions, not like what you were, not that you were a schizophrenic or you had schizophrenia. No, no, no. You were characterized by schizophrenic reactions. It was your behavior that we were talking about. And we just, as by fiat, got rid of that. And we started saying, oh, no, it was something you are or it's something you had rather than a typical way you behaved. We might want to come back and relook at that. Uh, but okay, so sociopathic personality disturbance. And then under this umbrella, you have antisocial reaction. All right, so antisocial. So this could be like antisocial personality disorder. Uh, and you also had uh, dissocial behavior. In uh, uh, the DSM-2, uh, we tried out some new language. And we said, rather than antisocial, what do we call just dissocial? Worth a shot, but we didn't really keep, keep it along. So, so what in 1952 was called sociopathic personality disorder, uh, you would have a subtype in, in DSM-2, and you'd call it uh, dissocial type. So what are we talking about here? Individuals who are not classified as antisocial personalities, but who are predatory and follow more or less criminal pursuits, such as racketeers, dishonest gamblers, prostitutes, and dope peddlers. Dissocial. That one didn't really last, but these are the kind of things we were putting under the umbrella of sociopathic personality disturbance. But of course, this even by 1968, the term sociopath was out of favor. If you have a PDF of the DSM-5, and you control F for sociopath or sociopathic, it's nowhere, it's nowhere. You can't, you can't get diagnosed by the DSM as having a sociopathy. But it is the DSM that this terminology came from, and where the, where the idea of sociopath is this general, you interact pathologically with society term came from. So DSM-3, personality disorder with predominantly sociopathic or asocial manifestation. Still in 1980, you can find sociopathic, but of course it's ick, you know, as if. Uh, so it's not a term that you can, you can uh, have labeled directly, put, put directly on you. So let's flash forward then, because there was a whole bunch of versions of the DSM-4, and it's not necessary uh, to go through those. So let's look forward to the DSM-5. This is in the appendix where they are playing with the idea of integrating Robert Hare's psychopathy checklist revised with antisocial personality disorder. In other words, well, it's already acknowledged that you have the pyramid of antisocial behavior. Here's, here's breaking the law, uh, here's breaking the law and not caring about breaking, well, breaking the law a lot. And then here's breaking the law and not caring about breaking the law. Here's breaking the law in ways that are atrocious. Here's breaking the law and not, not caring about breaking the law in ways that are atrocious. And then right up at the top, you have you know, the remorseless individuals. Uh, and for the longest time, you had antisocial uh, personality disorder. And then, uh, like the, uh, like the all-seeing eye or the floating pyramid on the Yankee money, uh, you had psychopathy, which was just separate. Uh, you couldn't get diagnosed by the DSM-5 with psychopathy. It was just a separate thing. You had to go see Robert Hare in Canada, uh, and he would give you the checklist, and you could get diagnosed, but it's not in the DSM-5. What they're trying to do is, well, what if we just bring that down? What if we just bring that down so that now you can get diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder with psychopathic uh, uh, traits. Okay, fine. But uh, it wasn't ready for prime time. It's still in the appendix, uh, the things to try out uh, for later uh, of the DSM-5. So what do you need to get antisocial personality disorder? And then what do you need on top of that to get with psychopathic features. Well, to get antisocial personality disorder, you need egocentrism. So, you know, you tend to look at the world from your own perspective and uh, not others. Uh, Self-direction, so are we interested in personal gratification? Uh, do you uh, tend not to conform with people? That's how most of the psychopath stories start, right? You run away from home or you run away from school. You, you don't like the rules. Lack of empathy or remorse, okay? Incapacity for intimacy. Oh, that seems like a harsh way of phrasing uh, what we saw in the checklist, uh, like uh, multiple, multiple marital relationships. So you just need two or more of those, and then six or more of your kind of classic uh, traits. Manipulativeness, callousness, deceitfulness, hostility, risk-taking, impulsivity, and irresponsibility. Okay, so this is just antisocial personality disorder in, in the appendix. So this, this is the version of it that anticipates uh, with psychopathic features option. So what are the psychopathic features on top of that, which has already incorporated a lot of Hare's checklist. Uh, they are low anxiousness. Oh, interesting. Okay, surprised me with that one. Uh, low social withdrawal. Okay, so what they're doing here is they're incorporating the relatively solid science of the big five, right? So low anxiousness. What's that? Low neuroticism. 
Uh, low social withdrawal, what's that? Well, that's extroversion. Ah, we're getting at what empirically we can say with validity over repeated trials we tend to see in psychopaths, i.e. we're sticking, because we're the DSM-5, uh, to very measurable things here. So they're very cautious about bringing in psychopathy into the DSM. And high attention seeking. Those are the psychopathic features? Yes, and, and in part, mostly because they've turned antisocial personality disorder into kind of psychopathy light, right? Callousness and deceit. I'm a very feeling person. You can't help but fall in love with these kids. Oh, that's so nice. She's a nurse, and she killed a bunch of kids. We're pretty sure she killed a whole bunch of kids. Does she really think that she like lovingly killed them? Or is this deceitfulness? Doesn't really matter much, does it? Unemotional, what do we got for unemotionality? Jack Abbott summed it up pretty nicely. Uh, so, so he did you know, all of the psychopath stuff, uh, killed Rob Forge documents, all the stuff we would expect in you know, a stereotyped picture. Because there are successful psychopaths. Uh, there are people with full-blown uh, uh, 30 psychopathy. Well, probably not because they're successful. But there are people who meet all of the factor one criteria uh, for psychopathy and act on it. So, so, so they have factor two as well. Uh, but they don't necessarily get caught or they don't offend in a way that offends society. So you ascend the corporate ladder through, through, through backbiting and, and being aggressive and blaming your, your faults on other people. Uh, and then you, know, you, you are successful. Uh, you have not broken any laws. Uh, maybe a few social contracts in terms of being manipulative, um, <clears throat> but you are elsewise successful. Uh, in Snakes with Suits, uh, Hare and uh, Babiak uh, talked about uh, how in uh, the corporate U.S. Uh, psychopaths are overrepresented uh, in uh, you know, you know, high, high impact uh, uh, corporate culture because it's easier for them to climb it. Uh, <clears throat> but they're, they're successful, right? Uh, the, the existence of successful psychopaths, that is people who are diagnostically psychopathic but have not committed crimes, uh, formally, uh, is important because it tells us that despite having psychopathy, you don't necessarily need to have robbed or killed or defrauded somebody, right? Oh, you're a psychopath, but you can succeed in other ways. Well, that means that maybe having psychopathy doesn't absolve you of guilt for murdering somebody, right? Because you could have gone to Wall Street, but instead you murdered someone. Go for it. Uh, yeah, pro -so yeah that, that's a term we had. Uh, another term, so, so pro-social psychopath, successful psychopath. Another term we tried out for a while, I think Hervé tried it out, uh, was sub-criminal psychopath. So you haven't done anything criminal in your life, you're just diagnostically a psychopath, and, but we call you a sub-criminal psychopath. So that's why that didn't work, but pro-social, yeah. That's, that's probably, I think that's what they used in Snakes and Suits, the pro-social psychopath. Because um, successful psychopath, successful psychopath exists in more places, so I don't know if, if pro-social has usurped it or not. But where did you see that? Was that, oh, a TED Talk. Yeah, well, there you go, then it's probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because successful psychopath, I mean, well, successful at what? Successful at not going to prison is, is generally what, what Hare and, and Babiak mean. <clears throat> okay, kill, round four documents, this is Jack Abbott. Uh, after serving the sentence, he, he came out and he's like, oh, well, I killed again. Um, I think Jack Abbott is the one that said, uh, said uh, uh, I wanted to see what it was like to kill someone. And, 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 then, and, then, and, then, and then everybody else was like, you just served time for killing someone. You already knew. And he was like, yeah, but that was a while ago. I think it was him. But he also said this. Uh, there are emotions, a whole spectrum of them, that I know only through words. Uh, this is from a survivor's account. Uh, a, a while ago, I did uh, a nice little abnormal psych textbook with, with, uh, with, with a buddy of mine. And we had, uh, she had survived being in a relationship with a psychopath. And the relationship had involved, at first, just them in a normal relationship. Uh, and then he took complete control of her finances and started a cult of which she had to be part and he brought very strange people into the, into the household uh, that were his like, sexual subordinates, uh, and she was one as well. Um, she got out intact, um, <clears throat> but this was her life. This is from her personal accounts. Um, You've never seen such a pair of eyes in all your life. There was no feeling in them. Those eyes, it was those eyes. At first, they appeared very beautiful and deep, and everywhere Dick went, people always commented on his amazing, deep, penetrating eyes. But my young children found them scary and unnerving from the very beginning. So they saw the kind of mask of sanity, the millimeter thick, uh, the discrepancy between what's behind and what's in front. And then she said, after the uh, cult slash religion stuff had started falling through, uh, and she just it completely reframed how she saw his eyes, and then she said his eyes looked cold and almost empty. The point is the eyes look different. There's a cool story from Robert Hare. I think it's in his book Without Conscience, which is still the best book on psychopaths. Uh, most of the other ones just copy and paste as well as they can. Examples that are like his. They were questioning a a psychopath who is a manipulator, and there was a detective, so just a just normal Joe detective type, and then there was a specialist, a you know, forensic psychologist. So the forensic psychologist sat across the table from him. From the detective's perspective, what happens over the course of the investigation between the psychopath and the forensic psychologist is that the psychopath looks all sparkly-eyed at the forensic psychologist, and next thing you know, the forensic psychologist is in the corner crying. He's in the corner crying. He's like, I don't, I don't really know what happened there, 
But then I sat down in front of him, and then he tried doing the sparkly eye thing with me, and I said, that bullshit only works on smart people. He's describing the eyes, as if there was some kind of magic in the psychopath's eyes that broke down the forensic psychologist. It does appear to be a center of narrative gravity. And so I mentioned that Cleckley, uh, what, one of the things Cleckley contributed was he just put out a list of, of, of a bunch of traits of psychopaths. Uh, so here's his list, uh, which, hey, this looks, this looks very similar. Uh, this is one, one of the items that is wrong. Psychopaths don't have above average intelligence. It's the, roughly the same as anybody else. Uh, they could potentially have more ability to get more out of that intelligence. If they don't care about the rights of other people, it opens up doors to them that we wouldn't walk through, that they might walk through. In terms of IQ or intelligence, as we might assess it formally, uh, you don't see a difference between psychopaths and the rest of us. And you can see uh, that a lot of this is uh, what was, was copied in uh, hair. It's, it's like this is remarkably, his work survives remarkably well. The Mask of Sanity, it still sells tons of copies because it's, it's foundational. Some random, very random psychopath statistics, uh, roughly 44% of uh, police officers who are killed on duty in the US are killed by people uh, uh, who are diagnosable as psychopaths. Of the offenders in custody, 10 to 25% are psychopathic. I think your textbook gives you the 15% number because uh, it tends to be more representative of Canada. In the US, you, you, you have a more overrepresentation of psychopaths. So there's one institution in the US, I can't remember what it is, but by the 30 standard, there's 37% of their inmates are psychopaths. But the range tends to be between 10 and 25%. So if you go to any random incarceration facility, uh, you will find roughly that percent of offenders being psychopathic, which is remarkable because they represent less than 1% of the population by base rate. Hare estimates that they account for up to 50% of serious crime. It, it's a bold claim, but if anybody has kind of the uh, research bona fides to make it, it would be Robert Hare. Finally, on our list of random psychopath stats, we have the fact that uh, pairing as best we can, case control, we find that psychopaths are about three times more likely to recidivate violent. That is, if we let them go, we'll see them again for a violent offense. Child psychopaths. Uh, the youth version of the psychopathy checklist uh, uh, is for kids aged uh, uh, 12 or youth aged 12 to 18. Um, but there's specific uh, uh, rules that say that if the child is not very independent, then you can still use the youth version of the checklist at age 20 and even 21. So in other words, if you kind of have you know, the experiences of a, uh, of a young person. So age 12 then. At age 12 is where we start to assess for psychopathy. Now, that's a pretty serious label. So here's a case. My son was always willful and difficult to get close to. At five years old, he figured out the difference between right and wrong. <gasps> if he gets away with it, it's right. And if he gets caught, it's wrong. Uh, punishment, threats, pleas, counseling, even a run at what we call psychology camp. I haven't made the slightest difference. He's now 15, and he's been arrested seven times. This happens in a lot of cases of psychopathy. Obviously, not all of them. Uh, John Wayne Gacy hadn't been arrested seven times. That's, he, that's why he's not a psychopath. He didn't offend young, or at least didn't get caught offending young. Um, but there's plenty of cases uh, where the problem started very early. And you know, you have the, 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 the stereotypical behavior of starting fires and torturing animals, especially torturing animals. Animal abuse, uh, indifference or poor emotional understanding is what you, what you see in kids as a kind of red flag. Uh, and by the way, I'm not saying that uh, if you are uh, a threshold for psychopathy as a child that you can't improve. You can. It just takes a lot more work. We try to make them feel our disapproval. We make them feel that, uh, that what they're doing is wrong or ineffective. Uh, and as Skinner said, an organism is rewarded simply by being effective. Uh, so rather than, rather than come up and say, hey, that's wrong, uh, what you might need to do is you might need to, all right, no, 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 what you did, what, no, no, look, look at me, look at me, what you did is wrong. Oh, look how sad I am. Look how sad I am. And you have to exaggerate more because they're not going to recognize your expression as much. Uh, oh, look how sad I am. Oh, it makes me sad when you behave like that. It takes a little more work. You've got to make the connection. You've got to exaggerate so that they feel it. Um, but uh, this is still uh, something that's been uh, 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 put forward as the best way to train a conscience into a kid who is at risk for or threshold for psychopathy. Um, uh, and more can be done early on. Like all of the other rules of personality apply to psychopathy. Yes, you, you, can, you can influence the pro progress of psychopathy. Can I use the word cure or anything because it is kind of a personality issue, um, but you, you can definitely uh, get kids to understand uh, their behavior a little better. And maybe, maybe fall out of threshold for psychopathy at least. All right, main concern uh, seems to be callous and unemotional traits, right? You're looking at your kid, and, and your kid doesn't care. Some, 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 something terrible happens. Uh, you, you, you witness a squirrel getting hit by a car, and you're like, oh, this will really make my kid sad. And then the kid's laughing at it or something. Uh, th these are the things that tend to, to bother uh, parents. And we, when we look at trait psychopathy, we have lots of measures assessing uh, uh, callousness and unemotionality, which you may recall is factor one, affective interpersonal. The, the psychopathy we measure from ages 12 to 18 is stable. You can change a little on it, but I'm going to predict that if you're threshold at point, one, uh, at, at point A, then you're going to be threshold uh, later on in life as well. 
relatively stable. So the youth version, the psychopathy checklist revised. Let's say you offend when you were 16 or 17, uh, and then we have you, and it's been like two or three years over the course of administration of justice, we'll assess you, but we'll assess you even though you're, you're now 20, we'll still assess you with the youth version. I don't know if that logically scans or coheres, but it's what we'll tend to do. What else do we see in child psychopaths? Fearlessness, uh, less of a startle response, poor fear and surprise perception in others. Hey, these are all the, all the things we're talking about in adults. Yeah, it all scans. Uh, same thing with the amygdala. In, in the kids' populations, you consistently have amygdala differences in uh, psychopathic versus non-psychopathic, and the frontal lobe deficits are also not consistent. So it's, it's the, what, what happens with the adult psychopath versus non-psychopath mirrored rather perfectly for the adolescents. There's been quite a few attempts to divide psychopathy up into two categories. So the idea that there's some psychopaths that are just born psychopaths, they're, just, they're never going to get the, the neural wetware to be, to be uh, uh, like us. Uh, and then there's other uh, individuals who they've had such a life that's so terrible that it has affected them in such a way as to make them psychopathic. I've never been convinced by any of these dichotomizing uh, types of arguments, but they're out there. My main point against this is, okay, sh sure, you, you have a poor bond with your caregiver and therefore you end up with psychopathy. But like, how is, this, how is this ruling out the idea that the child is a born psychopath? Picture this, you have a child that doesn't emotionally connect. Are you going to have a good bond with that child? No. Does it mean the fact that you don't have a bond with that child made them a psychopath? No, the psychopathy was prior. It was a priori. So I tend not to like these arguments, but that is a bias on my part. Maybe I'm too biologically deterministic rather than them being too infantile deterministic. Could be psychopathy leads to a poor bond. I would be surprised if it didn't. Regardless of what causes psychopathy, uh, the quality of family life uh, seems to have no effect on the emergence of criminality specifically in psychopaths. So all these psychopaths that are telling us about their, their terrible stories, um, uh, uh, we don't seem to see in the empirical literature a connection between a bad upbringing uh, and uh, criminality. The, the, the pithy explanation that most of the experts come up with is uh, crime is about opportunity and what's available to you. It's, it's not about you know, the, the wetware you're working with. All right, see you next week. I'll be up here if you've got questions.